In this lecture, we'll look at reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is first and foremost an abstract task, like regression, classification, or recommendation. The first thing we did in the first lecture when we first discussed the idea of machine learning was to take it offline. We simplified the problem of learning by assuming that we have a training set from which we learn a model once. We reduced the problem of adaptive intelligence to a function from a data set to a model by removing the idea of interacting with an outside world and by removing the idea of continually learning and acting at the same time. Sometimes those aspects cannot be reduced away. In such cases, we can use the framework of reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is the practice of training agents, for instance robots, that interact with a dynamic world and to train them to learn while they're interacting. We should think of reinforcement learning as an abstract task. And in fact, it is one of the most generic abstract tasks available. Almost any learning problem you encounter can be modeled as a reinforcement learning problem, although sometimes better ways of modeling do exist. The source of examples to learn from in reinforcement learning is the environment. The agent finds itself in a state and takes an action. In return, the environment tells the agent its new state and provides a reward. This is a number, and the higher the reward, the better. The agent chooses its action by a policy, which is a function from a state to an action. The policy is essentially the model that we learn. As the agent interacts with the world, the learner adapts the policy in order to maximize the expectations of future rewards. If you have a problem that you'd like to solve with reinforcement learning, then in order to translate your problem to the reinforcement learning abstract task, you must decide what your states and actions are and how to learn the policy. The only real constraint that reinforcement learning places on your problem is that for a given state, the optimal policy should not depend on the states that came before. Only the information in the currently observable state counts. This is a little bit like the Markov assumption that we saw in sequence learning. And for this reason, this kind of framework is known as a Markov decision process. Here is a very simple example. We have a floor cleaning robot inside a room. The room has six positions for the robot to be in. And in one of these, there is a pile of dust. For now, we assume that the position of the dust is fixed and the only job of the robot is to get to the dust as quickly as possible. Once the robot finds the dust, the world is reset and the robot is replaced somewhere in the room. This is not a very realistic example, but it pays to start very simple. To model this, we say that the environment has six states, which are the six squares that the robot can occupy. The actions that the robot can take are up, down, left, and right. And moving to any state yields a reward of zero, except for the goal state, the position where the dust is. And if the robot enters that state, it gets a reward of one. Note that in principle, there is no reward for getting closer to the dust. There is only a reward for finding the dust. And the task of reasoning backwards from the goal state to figure out which of the states are good states to move to in order to get to the dust is entirely up to the learner. Games can also be learned through reinforcement learning. In the case of a perfect information turn-based two-player game like tic-tac-toe, or at a larger scale chess or go, the states are simple board positions. The state of the board at a particular moment in the game is one of our states. The available actions are the moves that the player is allowed to make given the current state of the board. After an action is chosen, the environment chooses the opponent's move. So the environment in this case is essentially the opponent. The opponent makes his move and the environment returns to us the resulting state of the board. All states come with reward zero, except the states where the game is won by the agent, in which case the reward is one, or the game is lost by the agent, in which case the reward is minus one. A draw, like an unfinished game, yields a reward of zero. Here is an example called the card poll where the states follow one another more quickly. We have a small cart on a track, indicated by the black square here, and its task is to balance a pole, which is attached to the cart by a hinge. This is a bit like balancing a broom on your hand. The environment here is either the real world, if we're learning this in a physical setting, or a simulation of it, if we're learning this in a kind of simulator. 
the only state information we care about is the angle between the pole and the track, and the only actions that our learner can take are to move the cart left or right. And our award, again, is zero for almost all of the states, except for when we failed and the pole has fallen over, and then the reward is minus one. So again, from this failure state where the pole has fallen over, we need to somehow learn to reason backwards in time to find the correct actions. And to show you that these things don't just work in simulations, here is a model helicopter being controlled by a reinforcement learned program. The helicopter is fitted with a variety of sensors, telling it which way up it is, how high it is, its speed and so on. And the combined values for all of these sensors at a given moment form the state. The actions following this state are the possible speeds of the main and tail rotor. The rewards again are zero unless the helicopter crashes, in which case it gets a negative reward. To train the helicopter to do specific tricks, like flying upside down, we can give certain states a positive reward depending on what kind of trick we're looking for. One benefit of reinforcement learning is that a single system can be developed for many different tasks, so long as the interface between the world and the learner stays the same. Here is a famous experiment by DeepMind, the company behind AlphaGo, where the environment is an Atari simulator, an old game computer, and the state is a single image containing everything that can be seen on the screen. The actions are the possible movements of the joystick and the pressing of the fire button. The reward is determined by the score shown on the screen. The amazing thing here is that the system was not pre-programmed with any knowledge of any of these Atari games. For several of the games, the system learned to play the game better than the top human performance. We can extend the reinforcement learning framework in various ways. For instance, sometimes state transitions are probabilistic. The environment moves us from one state to another, but it doesn't do so deterministically. It does so based on a probability distribution that depends on the current state. Consider, for example, the example of controlling a robot. The agent might tell its left wheel to spin 5 mm, but on a slippery floor the resulting movement may be anything from 0 to 5 mm. Another thing you may want to model is partially observable states. For instance, in a poker game, you cannot see the cards of your opponent, and you cannot see some of the cards that are face down on the table. We won't deal with these extensions here, but it's useful to know that they exist if you ever need them. Before we decide how to train our model, Let's decide what it is first. There are many ways to present reinforcement learning models, but most of the recent breakthroughs have come from using neural networks. Our job is to map states to actions or states to a distribution over actions. In the case of the pole cart example, we can represent the state by two numbers, the position of the cart and the angle of the pole. And we have two actions. And we can represent a probability distribution over those two actions with a two node softmax layer. A function from states to actions is called a policy. So a neural network like this is called a policy network. If we somehow figure out the right weights for a network like this, then this is all we need to solve the problem. For every state, we simply feed it through the network, observe the probability distribution on the possible actions, and either choose the action with the highest probability or sample from the output distribution of the network. Here's what a policy network looks like for the Atari game setting. We take the image consisting of a small grid of pixels. We feed it through several convolution layers with ReLU units in between. We apply some fully connected layers and we map to an output that represents all the possible actions we can take. This includes moving the joystick in eight different directions, pressing the fire button, pressing the fire button and moving the joystick or doing nothing. So now all we need to do, given a policy network, 
is figure out how to update its weights while our agent is exploring the world. Now, even though reinforcement learning agents can theoretically learn in a kind of online mode, where they continuously update their model while they explore the world, this can be a very difficult setting to control in practice, and it may lead to very unpredictable behaviors. Practically, this is rarely how agents are actually trained. A much more common approach is that of episodic learning. We define a particular activity that we'd like the robot or the agent to learn, and we call that an episode. This could be one game of chess, one helicopter flight of a fixed length, or one Atari game for as long as the agent can manage to stay alive. We let the agent act one episode based on its current policy, we observe the total reward at the end of the episode, and use that to update the parameters of the policy to learn, essentially, and then we start another episode. Often, after training like this for a while, when we are convinced we have a good policy, we keep it fixed when we roll it out to production. That is, when you buy a robot vacuum cleaner, it may contain a policy trained by reinforcement learning, but it almost certainly won't update its weights as it's vacuuming your floors. So, what's the big problem? Our policy is represented by a neural network, and we already know how to find good weights for a neural network. We use mini-batch gradient descent and use backpropagation to work out the gradient. In reinforcement learning, there are four main problems that make learning difficult for us. And the first is the problem of sparse loss. Here the issue is that often very few states have a meaningful reward. In a chess game, for instance, there are three states with a meaningful loss. We lost, we won, or we drew. All other states, while the game is still in progress, provide no meaningful reward for us. The job of our reinforcement learning algorithm is not just to pick actions that maximize the immediate reward, which would be relatively easy to do, but to pick actions that lead to high rewards in the future. Any successful reinforcement learning system knows how to propagate rewards and losses back through time. But even the best systems have trouble learning under very sparse loss. In those cases, we can apply some tricks to help the model along. We can, for instance, start with imitation learning. If we have a large database of human chess matches, then we can train a chess playing policy first to predict the moves that humans made according to our database from a given state, and then inserting that model into a reinforcement learning setting so that its initial exploration is not absolutely random. We can also use reward shaping, where we replace the zero rewards that we get for intermediate states with guesses for the actual value of the state. This is, for instance, easy to do in chess, where there are certain basic rules that allow you to assess how good a particular board state is for either of the players long before the game has been won or lost. And finally, you can add auxiliary goals, such as formalizations of curiosity or basic goals like maximum distance traveled. And this can be very useful to help the agent explore the world far enough that it starts encountering states that have non-zero rewards. And once it's encountered those, it can start reasoning backwards to the start state to do its own learning. The problem of delayed reward in reinforcement learning is that what we have to decide on is our immediate action, but we don't get immediate feedback. For instance, in the card poll task, if the poll falls over, it may be because we made a mistake 20 time steps ago, but we only get the negative reward when the poll finally hits the ground. Once the poll started tipping over to the right, we may have moved to the right 20 times to keep the poll upright for as long as we could, and these were very good actions that should be rewarded. They were just too late to save the situation. That does mean that when we finally get our negative reward, the 20 actions preceding that negative reward were actually very good actions, and only the action before that, 21 steps ago, was the bad action that got us into trouble. Another example is crashing a car. If we're learning to drive, this is a bad outcome that should carry a negative reward. However, most people brake just before they crash, and those are good actions that just happen to fail to prevent a bad outcome. We shouldn't learn not to brake before a crash. We should work far enough backwards to where we went wrong, like taking a turn at too high a speed, and apply the negative feedback primarily to those actions. This is also called the credit assignment problem. For the rewards that we see over time, we need to decide which actions they apply to. And that's really what reinforcement learning is all about. Now, if we draw the execution of an episode like this, 
we are essentially unrolling the execution of the network over time, much like we did with recurrent neural networks. If we could apply backpropagation through time here, which is the trick that we used then, we could let the backpropagation algorithm deal with the credit assignment for us. We take the reward at each point, and we simply backpropagate it backwards through time to compute the gradients over all the instances of the weights. Here, unfortunately, backpropagation through time doesn't work. A lot of parts of this computation graph are not differentiable. Most importantly, the environment. We don't usually know exactly how the environment works. This is actually what we need to find out through exploration. And that means that we don't have a function that we can backpropagate through. This is the problem of non-differentiable loss. And the final problem in reinforcement learning is the trade-off between exploitation and exploration. To illustrate, let's look back to the example of the robot's vacuum cleaner. It starts in the bottom left of the room, and it needs to find the state in the top right of the room where it gets a reward of plus one. Now imagine that there's also a long hallway at the end of which there is a state with a reward of plus 100. Now if we start the agent off by stumbling around randomly, it will most likely find the plus one reward first. After a few resets, it will have figured out how to return to the plus one reward very quickly. And if it only exploits that knowledge, it will simply keep coming back for the plus one reward and never find the plus 100 reward at the end of the long corridor. An agent that follows a more random policy that sometimes moves away from known rewards will explore more and eventually find the bigger treasure. At first, however, the exploring agent does markedly worse than the exploiting agent. There is no definite answer for how to optimize this trade-off, but a few best practices and simple tricks exist, and we'll look at those later in the lecture. In the next two videos, we'll look at some algorithms for solving the reinforcement learning task. The first is random search, which is simply the same algorithm that we already saw in the second lecture. This was a black box algorithm, which didn't require us to compute any gradients, so we can apply it directly to a problem like this. The second is policy gradients, and the third is deep Q-learning.